Hi, I'm Michael, and this is Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about the 2014 film Gone Girl, and I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, writer Trisha Arand. Good afternoon. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello. And editor Alex Cayeros. Hi. So Gone Girl is an interesting movie because it was the movie for the first video of the channel. Like the first video I released was about Gone Girl. So it's kind of interesting revisiting it now and going back to it. I kind of began with Gone Girl because I'm a huge Fincher fan. It had come out relatively recently when I started the channel. So the channel began May or June of 2016. Uh, And when Gone Girl came out, I was obsessed with it. I love crime films. I love mystery noir films. And so I'd already read the screenplay. And as I was trying to figure out, okay, what are some fun videos to talk about screenwriting from? It was like, okay, I love this movie. I've already read the screenplay. I have a bunch of notes. So let's start with this. And in my head, it was like, this is going to be like a small movie. I'll start with a small movie that some people might like click on the video for and then the next video i'm going to do Mm -hmm. independence day and it's going to blow up and everyone's going to love it (laughs) and i released gone girl and it blew up and like made it to the front page of reddit and had eight thousand subscribers within a week and it hundreds of thousands of views and i was like this is amazing and then i very excitedly went and released independence day a few weeks later and like no one watched it (laughs) and no one cared at all (laughs) and that's when i learned to not you can't you can't predict the internet yeah no well rewinding a little bit how did how did you come to even think to make a video about the screenplay of gone girl in the first place because you originally were not you you didn't approach this as a video essayist at first correct right originally the the kind of birth of the channel was that i'd been doing a lot of editing documentary stuff for a while just like paying the bills with all these gigs and this one documentary that Alex and I were working on actually together was a, it was a documentary about an esports team and we were going to be following them they were like being treated as a startup and like all this money was being poured into it and they were going to like change the game and do things differently and we were going to they hired us as a documentary crew to follow them wow. all the way to like the biggest thing ever and then the team lost their first game in the playoffs and overnight it all went away like all the funding was pulled and it was just like that like silicon valley investor was like screw this never mind <gasps> right oh my <laughs> and, like God. we'd like fight to get paid it was like a whole thing it yeah. was a mess and terrible and it went from like <laughs> you're financially supported for a year to goodbye wow. uh, <laughs> but it ended up being a you know uh, a good thing because so then suddenly i was left with some savings uh, and a bunch of free time. And I wanted to get back to my like filmmaking roots and back to being creative and thinking about filmmaking. And so I decided to read a bunch of screenplays. So I started reading a bunch of screenplays and then I thought, okay, how can I kind of help myself remember all the lessons that I'm learning? So I was like, well, maybe I'll do a blog series and I'll just write blog posts for every screenplay that I write or read. And so I started writing blog posts and then pretty soon, I realized I think maybe these could be videos. And at the time I was watching a lot of, you know, Nerd Writer and Every Friend Painting and Captain Christian had just come out. And so the video essay scene was kind of blowing up at the time. And I was like, I think I have the skills to do that. So uh, I that idea kept, you know, gnawing at me, staying in my head. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to write a script for a video essay. And so I did a bunch of research and wrote this first uh, video and this first video actually went through many, many different phases. Like there was, I made the first like two minutes first and showed it to people and got feedback and then went and rewrote it and then showed that to people and then went back and rewrote it. And so I think I made this Gone Girl video four or five times before arriving at the final product. Um, Partially because when I was first recording my voiceover, I realized I was doing impressions of different people. Oh. Like, I've done, like there was a little bit of like nerd writer in there and then a little bit of CGP Grey I would do a lot of. Mm. And I listened to a lot of uh, Serial, the podcast uh-huh. with Sarah Koenig. So I was doing a hardcore Sarah Koenig impression for a while. So I had to do it a couple times to kind of like, okay, what's what's my voice version of that? What is the Michael voice? Right. But yeah, so, so finally I did this fifth version it felt good and i was like all right i'm gonna you know design this channel and maybe this could be a thing that takes off maybe it won't and luckily this first video took off and it was like okay i think maybe there's something here worth pursuing what were you expecting going into that first release like you obviously went through a lot of iterations so you were trying to make sure it was a 
good first release you were maybe hoping that it could go somewhere or was it more just like I just, well, I'll just see what happens and just trying to cut share with share with friends or what, what were your expectations going into this so I one of the things I wanted to do was be very purposeful with all the choices I was making and to sort of give some backstory with both me and Alex so Alex and I started a YouTube channel seven years ago eight years ago uh, nine years about finite ago? films. Yeah, finite films. I mean, it was 2011, so oh eight, year, eight years okay. ago. So basically, we had already done the YouTube thing a little bit, and uh, it didn't take off the way that we wanted to. And part of that was, I think, just we were so focused on making stuff we liked that we didn't put any thought into how do we get it out there and mm-hmm. like Audience. publicity yeah. and like yeah. all that stuff. So I, I wanted to be much more focused on that with the channel. So it was designing a channel and a video that I thought could get traction on Reddit, could be shared, could fall into this, you know, category of video essays. So I was trying to be strategic about it, but also find something that I thought was interesting and wasn't out there and that I would enjoy making. And randomly, I released the summer before a visual effects breakdown video. So in 2001, Space Odyssey, there's that Mm -hmm. shot where like, they're walking down the hallway and it's that tubular hallway and they get to the end like at the end of the hallway you see a ladder that's like rotating around because it's in space and the Mm -hmm. spaceship and so they step then on to like the ladder portion and then they start spinning but the hallway doesn't i'd always wanted to figure out how they did that so i did a stabilized shot where like assuming gravity is the same and they shot it on earth with gravity how would they have had to do this <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. uh, and so i did the stabilized shot where it kind of reveals how they did it and i released that on the movie subreddit and it kind of took off so i kind of had some sense of like okay i think i know who the movie subreddit is and i think i can make something that other people will like and get shared and so that was kind of the intention behind yeah it's kind of like you started making things that people actually go to youtube for because that was part of our problem was we were just these like <laughs> cocky, like, you know, kind of fresh out of film school guys who were like, we're going to make 20 minute, like very ambitious short films. And that's what people are going to like want to watch on YouTube. I don't watch 20 minute <laughs> nope. short films on YouTube. Right. And I, I don't know anyone that does. <laughs> I definitely go to YouTube to watch things like Lessons from the Screenplay or Alt Shift X or yeah, just these more information or just while I'm washing dishes kind of videos. Um, and, so it was it was a smart move to think about what could help you become a better writer, things you were doing anyway, and also kind of be appropriate for the YouTube format. Totally. And I remember when that came out because we were friends, uh, not not close friends or anything like that, but we were friends on Facebook. And so I remember when you launched the <laughs> channel and and it was crazy and you had all these like followers right away and stuff. You are in a niche essentially in terms of just analyzing screenplay and Mm -hmm. focusing just on the writing portion, because I think a lot of the other essays that you talk about are more broadly sort of dissecting and analyzing film. And so just focusing on the writing aspect, I think was really wise of you um, in addition to being like helpful. Rather than just doing what everyone else was already doing. Exactly. I, at the time was uh, teaching a screenwriting like summer camp for teens and we pulled up that video the gone girl video and I was like my friend just launched this channel let's watch this video I think it's helpful and it was super helpful the teens like really responded to it uh, so even back then I mean it's really funny because we can get into how different it is from, um, <laughs> from the current videos right from yeah. Well, because you've really found your way into what it is that we do now we've all f- Tr- hopefully tried to find our way <laughs> yeah. into the videos that we are like currently making and it's quite different but still very very helpful because i don't think at the time especially there was anybody discussing screenwriting in quite the same way or in the same form mm-hmm. there are other channels about writing um like sage who does just write has another awesome channel about writing but at the time it was definitely the only one looking at screenwriting and one of the things that i wanted to do was like not a lot of video essays, especially at the time, were about like the philosophy or like, what does it mean that the camera is like in this corner of the room? And like, what does that symbolize? Mm-hmm. And I was very much at the point where I was like, I don't care about that. Just what are the fundamentals? Like, what are the things you need to tell a story well? And so I wanted to take almost like a scientific approach because a lot of the videos I watched were science shows and SciShow and Vsauce and stuff. That was kind of my question. Could you take that kind of more scientific philosophy and apply it to 
screenwriting and just like what are the definite steps that will take you to something that is actually helpful to tell your story. And so that's kind of been the marching orders in my head since the inception of the channel. I think one of the things that's continually surprised me and just been kind of illuminating since you've launched this channel is how many stories we've heard about it being talked about in like high places in Hollywood and how like there's executives who like are giving notes on things who don't know anything. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> like it's it's like there's a lot of people in the industry that are finding this channel very, very helpful because a lot of people who are the ones who are supposed to know these fundamentals and are supposed to be shepherding films actually don't. They don't really know. <laughs> and it's interesting how uh, you really filled this void that existed almost industry wide of just having kind of like a clear, concise reference for these fundamentals. You don't you don't have to read all these freaking screenwriting books and slog through them and kind of get to the core of them. You have this almost like cheat code channel, <laughs> which I think is people really appreciate. And yeah, it continues to shock me how it's like, yeah, like these people don't really know what they're doing and they're like going to LFTS to like get some advice. <laughs> it's like, wow. Well, there's also, there's, there's a sort of journey of educating yourself on something. And I think too many people think that journey has an end. So it's like, well, I did read these three screenwriting books and I took that one course in college. So, and I, my first screenplay sold, so I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm, I already know how to do this. I'm going to do this forever. And I think it's cool to be working on a channel where we're constantly like we never know what the next video is going to be because we feel like we we have to figure out what we haven't covered yet. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, I love this movie. It's great. We, let's talk about how the protagonist changes. Like, no, we've done that. Everyone knows that now. You know, <laughs> yeah. okay, then let's let's go deeper. Let's find this other thing. And I think that that's kind of what makes it valuable for us yeah. as a team, and also for hopefully the people um, watching our videos and listening to our our uh, podcasts and stuff is that sort of continuing education mm -hmm. of like let's find these deeper concepts to to dive into. I mean, absolutely. I. I was very smug uh, going into, <laughs> coming in. <laughs> it's so unlike me, going into writing for the channel, I definitely was in a similar position to the one you're describing, Brian, where I was kind of like, listen, I've been writing for years. I've got it. I'm a working screenwriter. It's fine. It's going to be easy. And I didn't really hold a lot of I didn't hold high views of people who like read screenwriting books. I was kind of like, those people are just, they can't do it. They, so they're reading these books and whatever. I was very, very snobby coming into this. And how much I've learned is a little bit crazy to me. And come around on reading screenwriting books, <laughs> which I never thought that I would do. But yeah, it is that that humility to know that you don't know everything. What is the name? of that, I always forget the name of it, the name of that principle where people who are have expertise in a certain area tend to under-report their expertise. Mm. We'll look it up, but- um, Because they know, they know how much they don't know. Exactly, right. it's that yeah, the more exactly. that you learn about something, the more that you understand how much there is to know about that topic. And so people who are actually experts tend to underreport their expertise and people who are not experts tend to overreport their expertise in a certain area. So it's the equivalent of somebody yelling on Twitter about being an expert and they're talking to like a PhD who mm. actually is an expert. It's sort of the equivalent of that and finding that for in myself like it has been very humbling <laughs> and also like I very useful for me even in my own writing and it's a, wonderful to be a part of a team that embraces a spirit of learning because I think ego in Hollywood is very pernicious and dominant and crippling. Yeah. Yeah. It can be. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was part of the journey of arriving at the channel too. Cause I, I was also in that same point of like screenwriting books. Ugh, like save the cat. Ugh, Robert <laughs> McKee. I mean, blah. I still say, Ugh, to save the cat I mean, personally. So I think what I had to arrive at <laughs> was that there are valuable lessons in Pretty much all of them, but not all of each individual book is a worthwhile lesson. None of them are like a biblical text you can right. go to as like, this is the answer. This is going to solve right. my problems. Yeah. And some are written as if they are that. And that's <laughs> right. what's annoying. Uh, right. But it, but I think, yeah, being able to read them all and then kind of extract what are the things that 
are resonating with me and kind of creating this collection of those things for mm -hmm. yourself. And that's what the channel has done for me. And and I think it was uh, when I started the channel, I was listening to a lot of Hello Internet, the CGB Gray and mm -hmm. Brady Heron podcast. And one of the things Gray talks a lot about in that is like, when you're doing something new, try to create something that will have value no matter what, like I'm kind of paraphrasing, but basically I wanted to design something where even if the channel failed and didn't become financially sustainable or all that stuff, I would still learn a ton along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's, that was just a really good piece of advice that I don't come across a lot. It's like, you know, it's okay to fail, but like when you're designing something, like make it so that even if you fail, you've learned, like there is no fail because right. you're always right. going to be developing yourself. Nice. So what specifically about Gone Girl was it that I mean, you talked about like for practical reasons, you were trying to pick something not as big of a movie or whatever, but you said it fascinated you from the minute you saw it and you were obsessed with it. Why? So I've always loved noir thriller whodunit-esque stories mm -hmm. and I love Fincher. And so this was, a you know, both of those things happening. And I thought, you know, there aren't a lot of stories and movies coming out anymore that have that just kind of thriller aspect where like there's going to be a big twist and like we find it like who did it and who didn't do it and who's like playing who mm -hmm. um and i thought this was a take on that kind of noir like residential like domestic thriller that i hadn't seen in a long time that had a really fun twist spoiler alert if you haven't seen it like the halfway <laughs> point when you realize that she is still alive like the whole movie shifts and becomes this other thing and just the experience of watching in a theater was enthralling in a way that i hadn't had just because there aren't that many of these movies in existence mm -hmm. and so it made me want to run and read the screenplay and kind of figure out how how is that done and why is it so compelling throughout the throughout the story yeah it's interesting. It's a fascinating read, being Gillian Flynn's first screenplay. Right. Um, we don't often get to read the first screenplay of anybody. And <laughs> obviously, quite an experienced writer going into it. You know, she worked at Entertainment Weekly for years um, and then had written two novels by that point already. So, the, you know, this is her third novel. And it, it is what you were saying in the video about the efficient action lines is really brilliant and inspired and it makes me wonder like how much of it I know that she and Fincher went very very intensely back and forth about the script or she would just write like whole chunks of text and send them to Fincher and Fincher would like edit them and send them all back and um so I wonder how much of that was learned along the way uh, mm -hmm. or possibly suggested by Fincher or you know what what part of that process I guess it's impossible to know but it is it is a really exemplary in that way would you pick the same lessons again? Probably not. Okay. Uh, it, yeah. It's, so it's interesting. Yeah. Revisiting it now because there are definitely things that I would not do again. And like, I think. What were the lessons just for people who haven't seen the video recently? It, so, yeah. So one of the lessons was, as Trisha said, the efficient action lines. So how to write action lines in your script that convey tone and all the kind of, you know, subtext in a very quick and efficient way. Uh, there was the lesson from John Truby's. Uh, book about the last line is the point of the scene so how mm -hmm. to like make sure the scene ratchets up so that the last line is when it like hits home and you you get what it was all about um and then the final lesson was about subplot characters or at least what john truby calls subplot characters and i feel like that's a very specific to him terminology mm -hmm. that i probably wouldn't use anymore um but the lesson being how to use characters in your story as comparisons to the protagonist to to kind of uh, define them by showing who they're not. Or like, you know, in, in Gone Girl, Nick goes and talks to one of the former boyfriends of Amy and hears about like his story and his experience with Amy. And it kind of gives the audience like, oh, this is what she was capable of back then. And that kind of informs mm -hmm. both us and him about, oh, this is kind of who we're dealing with in the story. So yeah, so those were the three lessons. And I think probably the biggest thing that's different about the video uh how it's done then versus how we do it now is like we try to make sure each lesson kind of builds on itself and mm -hmm. so one video is kind of just different shades of the same lesson or kind of builds up the structure to the the final point that's being made the way i put it is every every video current video at least is about three things but about one thing 
Right. You right. know, it's sort of three different versions or three different pieces of this greater lesson that's being told. It's very like classic essay, right? I mean, it's a video yeah. essay. And yeah. it's like, you know, here's the thesis and here are three supporting, you know, mm -hmm. paragraphs well, about that thesis. And the thesis of Gone Girl, uh, the Gone Girl video is don't underestimate the screenwriter. And so it is, it does provide a really, even though it's three disparate lessons, it does provide a really good intro to the channel. Foundation. Of just like, yeah, by the way, also, screenplays are important, like <laughs> right, right, right. internet, in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. It, in in taking three totally different things, it does sort of provide that foundation for the channel. Yeah. Um, and but... I wish that was more intentional. Like, I feel like it worked <laughs> out very nicely that way. And it was my friend, Adam Harrison, actually, who suggested the title for the video. And I was like, nice. oh, that's the best title ever. And it kind of yeah works as like... This is the like the marching orders for the channel. Like this is what the channel is about. And if you like that tagline, you can now buy some merchandise <laughs> with that tagline on it. It's true. We have mugs. We have shirts. Visit our store. Link Ooh, in the show I like notes. our notebook a lot. Sorry. Yeah, it, our notebook is my favorite thing because it says "Don't underestimate the screenwriter," but then it also says "Respect the audience. respect the audience yeah. on the inside," which. I feel like holding both of those things as a screenwriter, like don't underestimate yourself, screenwriter, also respect your audience. Both of those things are sort of the responsibility of a good screenwriter. Good things. Yeah. yeah. What do you, what would you talk about now if you were going to make a Gone Girl video today? Or if you were going to be like recording a podcast about For Gone example. Girl. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, for example. <laughs> what would you want to talk about on a podcast about Gone Girl? <laughs> Theoretically oh. speaking. Dipping into adaptation mode here. <laughs> Um, we, we're forever going to be meta now because <laughs> of adaptation. It was interesting revisiting it. Uh, and I, I almost worried that it wasn't going to hold up as much as I, you know, the hype level that I, the loft or whatever. I liked it a lot back then. And I was afraid I wasn't going to like it as much. But I feel like it still works for me as this kind of noir thriller and i think the thing that i've come to appreciate a lot more are the the supporting characters and mm -hmm. just how much mm -hmm. they are the reason i feel like you care about anything that's right. happening because yeah. i feel like yeah <laughs> ben affleck and rosamund pike's characters are just so like distancing for me because they're so unlikable in so yeah. many ways that yeah. it's really when the detective comes into the story mm -hmm. uh, what's that actress's name Kim, Kim Dickens. Dickens. Oh, I just She's love amazing. I love her so, so much. And yeah. I think that first scene where she comes to the house she's putting the sticky notes next to the mm -hmm. clues. I'm like I like you. I want to watch you. I want to know you. And that's really where I got drawn into the movie was when those supporting characters started to enter because mm -hmm. I was so much I, yeah, I was so much more interested in them in some ways than the protagonist. Well you have to find a way into it as an audience member right. because again when you have these very nefarious and uh, <laughs> deceitful characters. Sociopathic. Sociopathic <laughs> characters. You need to have somebody to walk you through it that you can root for, basically. And and Bo Detective Ronda Boney. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the names of the characters in the book are just Interesting like, names. Okay. okay. <laughs> we call Margot Go? Sure. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I noticed that in the second viewing. I'm Why? like, oh, they're referring to her as Go. It's better than Marg. I mean, the book, <laughs> the book refers to her as Go only. Oh, much. interesting. They say her name like one time, and then it's Go with a capital G for the whole movie. I mean, book, which is, again, great. <laughs> uh, but Trisha, you have some thoughts about this book and movie, I'm right? here to say something great about Detective Rhonda Boney. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from her name. Apart from her name. <laughs> which is that, no... So I, I think about this movie um, and this book in more of the tradition of what is generally known as Roman noir, which is different than, say, like hard boiled like crime fiction. So you, you sort of in like American crime fiction, you have this sort of hard boiled Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, those guys. And then you also have like mob and like organized crime kind mm -hmm. of like literature. And this is very much more in the tradition of let's focus on the actual lead up to the crime, why it was committed, what is the actual motive behind the crime and the people who are doing it. And then also Roman noir tends to end in like a downbeat of a place or like a psychologically place of darkness. And it could so easily be very oppressive to watch, and I kind of find it to be oppressive anyway. But <laughs> the fact that there are these detectives characters, they're not the main characters. 
But the fact that they are in there serve as an audience surrogate sort of where they're trying to find the truth as well in the same way that we are. Well, it's also like, you know, there's the sort of make your character likable or sympathetic or, you know, whatever, uh, or at least fascinating. And uh, especially, you know, I think Amy is at least fascinating in some ways, but Nick is not really much very fascinating of a character. He's just sort of there. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's sort of like the protagonist of the movie is you watching the movie right. and mm. it's the mystery that's unfolding. There's this sort of the elements of mystery, what's being, what's being kept from the audience versus what's being kept from the characters, for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we're kind of like, we don't know anything until Nick figures it out. But then once he figured it out, then we're on this other journey of watching things happen. Um, and I think that's sort of, so someone like the detective characters, especially you have, you have her and Patrick Fugit's character who he's sort of saying what the cops are expected to think. And then she's sort of one step right. ahead going, what about this? Yeah. You know? And I think it's always nice to have those characters that are saying what you're thinking. Cause otherwise mm-hmm. you're going to be going, why didn't you look in there? Why didn't you do this? And it's like, they're doing that work for you. So you can, and you still, even though they're doing that work for you, you're still one step behind going, but I'm not yeah. sure where we're going here. You know, this movie really reminds me of, like so again going back to some of these the classic examples of this kind of thing of like the postman always rings twice or like double indemnity sort of Mm -hmm, these like mm -hmm. where it's you get entangled in the relationship uh that's driving the crime essentially and it's this manipulative thing like how's it gonna end are they gonna destroy each other basically which they almost always do double indemnity is like a really solid comparison i think to this movie yeah is it edward g robinson i think that Mm -hmm. plays his that plays in Double Indemnity that plays the like other insurance like executive kind of guy that he's also sort of like mm. continually checking in and trying to sort of solve it in his own way. Yeah. So you do have to have that character. And I really like the portrayal here of them. I think it was a lot of other characters from the novel got cut. Mm. And obviously you wouldn't be able to cut both of the detective characters or even one of them maybe, but how they're portrayed in the movie, the way that those characters are retained create some kind of like a lantern and light for us to follow through this otherwise very well there's the pressure of just like absolutely they're yeah they're right behind him at every moment mm-hmm. like they're right. literally following him some of the time and so that that i think is a big motivator and helps you know create that the suspense of like mm-hmm. what's gonna happen are they gonna arrest him and it's interesting and it, so i think this is a an example of just kind of like taste happening in movies where it's just sometimes some people like certain things work for them, even if it's not maybe objectively. But like, I really find Ben Affleck's character really interesting. Mm. And I think it's because I like the idea that's explored where it's like, he's not a good person, but now he's thrown into the situation where it looks like he's guilty of murdering his wife. And how that gets kind of, how that spirals out of control, I think is a really fascinating thing yep. as an idea for me and how you know the movie clearly talks about how the media takes it and like mm-hmm. well we're gonna make a narrative out of this and like this is the role you're supposed to play and like i think as probably also as someone who like navigates social situations in kind of weird ways sometimes i empathize with you know the press conference scene where they're like he's standing next to the picture and i mm-hmm. feel like i'd be like yeah i'm standing they're taking a picture do i smile i heard, thought right. I heard someone say right. smile so i guess i'll smile but now everyone thinks that means this so i right. i empathized with like he's maybe not the brightest person he's just trying to do the best he can but the best he can becomes fuel for him looking guilty. It all looks bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's the difference between is this character, you know, does this character deserve to be punished for, you know, their history or their actions versus does this character deserve this? (laughs) You know, does it do they deserve what they're going through? And you can argue one way or another, but obviously it's like Nick is not as bad as he has to deal with, you know, for so much of the movie. Well, Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier it's like oh god thank god the detective comes in because i can't identify with these two protagonists but i do think i guess i guess amy's not a protagonist i don't know we have to talk about this Mm -hmm. um i'm referring to them as dual protagonists but i don't know what that means i think that's an arguable yeah Yeah, i think my my subconscious was saying that and i was saying it uh anyway that but yeah not identifying with them aside i did really enjoy this movie especially on the second viewing i think the first viewing when i saw it in theaters the ending just left me so oh yeah weird and i was trying to like was the whole thing kind of like just total satire like the ending felt so satirical and almost surreal and mm-hmm. and so i was kind of just like i don't know what that was and watching it again it just it is so masterful the way it unfolds and 
the way that it reveals information and how it's a you know the untrustworthy there's a better yeah, the unreliable narrator. unreliable narrator uh yeah it's just there's so much good stuff and i was watching it again with my husband and he also likes kind of thriller crime <laughs> movies mm-hmm. and you know he he longed for the days of like the ashley judd you know double mm-hmm. jeopardy movies you know like, why aren't those happening anymore yeah. yeah and so we watched it again last night and he was just like oh this was so good like it's such a good movie and i realized oh yeah like this is your kind of movie and we don't really make many of these like well you yeah know? they almost like just don't exist anymore yeah. yeah yeah unless they're just really cheap and yeah not that I went through. I threw a little. Uh, I saw it in the theater, and I was like, "Okay, like I'm a big Fincher fan, so I'm very like forgiving of you know anything he does." Um, and I was like, "But yeah, I liked it. Cool." And then I watched it when it came out on Blu-ray with with my roommate at the time, and I think at th- that time I was like, "My biggest problem with this movie is it doesn't feel like a movie." It feels like it should have been like a four part miniseries, mm. you know, where it's like each episode it ends with like he's having an affair and Amy's still alive and Amy comes home and it's like you could make these like four or, you know, if there's more stuff in the book, six, yeah. who knows, uh, episodes that are like really, really intense and like th- each episode could have a different protagonist. One episode is Nick based, one episode is Amy based, that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. watching it as a movie, it was just like, oh, it's so long of just like a drama of like things happening and blah, blah, blah. And then watch it um, the other night uh, to you know for this obviously and mm-hmm. now had that i had that expectation i was like okay <laughs> so it's sort of like i finally got to the point where i'm like i know what this movie is i know what to expect and i can just sit back and enjoy it for what it is i don't want to watch it every day but when i do watch it i'll enjoy it mm-hmm. I-, I do wonder if 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 it was made right now if it would be pitched as a miniseries right. i don't think it could be made now i feel like it came out at the last yeah. possible time right. they I mean, could I think it, it, it could be made as like well, a sharp object i was gonna know. say yeah. yeah they made sharp objects right. That's the night manager the things original like that gillian, yeah. like gillian flynn's first novel is sharp mm. that is her first one is okay. sharp objects um and then they made it into an eight part miniseries i think um yeah. with Amy probably Adams. didn't have to be that long but it definitely did not yeah need to be that long. <laughs> i'll tell you that right now i enjoyed watching it yeah it the first couple episodes oh, are so slow. I almost gave up. Yeah. I almost gave up too. I'm just like, wow, nothing has happened. Um, nothing has happened. <laughs> so, and it, it does have sort of that like satisfaction of a slow burn once you kind of get it starts to get really like interesting. Um, and again, it's very similar sort of in tone in a lot of ways to this. Uh, similar characters, very, very diabolical (laughs) (laughs) diabolical people yeah Yeah. um but yeah i having read the book i was impressed i thought that structurally the the book is such a twisting and turning ride that you know the experience of reading the book is what exactly you need to try to duplicate so if you are tasked if you happen to be gillian flynn and david fincher in this in this scenario the book, you know, was on the bestseller list for well over a year. It was like, and made so much ridiculous money. And because of that unpredictability as you read it, but it is almost hard to even, like critics at the time were like, this is even hard to talk about though, because half of the book is told from the point of view of a lying, unreliable narrator. Mm. And so once you get to that midway point, it totally flips. And so having the responsibility to maintain that like psych out essentially is I I imagine would be an incredible challenge but I think Gillian Flynn did a really nice job and actually the structure is pretty much exactly retained from the book Mm. so the book is broken up into three parts the first part is really long it's basically half the book and it's the whole story of she's gone missing and then it's the accompanying diary entries it flips back and forth and then it stops it switches to Amy's point of view that's like the last that's like another third of it and then the last little chunk is the shortest and so the book is divided into those three pieces and I think it works well um it creates a very thrilling experience and i didn't see it in the theaters but it's it's compelling i mean in theaters when it goes to that midpoint where it cuts to her in the the car the cool girl and the other cool girl uh, monologue yeah yeah Yeah. i I watched it with my girlfriend who hadn't seen it and um right before the reveal uh i was like oh do you need to take a break you know like refill a drink she's like sure so during the break i was like any thoughts she's like i I don't know she's like it's it couldn't be him it's too obvious you know she's like did the parents do it she's like i don't know and then about two minutes before the movie revealed it she went got it (laughs) i was was like you beat the movie by just like just enough you know that was definitely like 
I think in in the theater that was one of those like movie moments where I was like, oh my god, I'm so like mm. having so much fun that you're doing this now, and just the montage is executed amazingly, and I just love watching David Fincher frame what, anything. It's like perfect David Fincher montage, like peak right mode, like, yeah. The perfect shots of her like doing things quickly with the monologue. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I also love that it lets the movie evolve from just a like, did he do it? Didn't he do it? Right. To like at the halfway, it's like, okay, well, now we know. And now it's become this other movie of like, we know he didn't do it, but now he looks more guilty than ever. So is he going to get out of it? And I, I think I, that's a cool thing to have in a film that I feel like doesn't happen of like, now it's a different, it's the same story, but it's a different kind of genre almost or a different it's a different mystery right mm. yeah exactly i think the unreliable narrator thing it's done I, I think it works in this movie because it's done sparingly um i think it can be really alienating when you realize that the movie just lied to you for 20 minutes yeah. or something you know and i remember obviously i remembered that like her diary was fake but i didn't remember if the footage we were seeing was mm. fake mm -hmm. so I was like oh did he actually push her accidentally and she is just writing you know in her brain it was way more worse but we we're seeing the actual real thing and then you realize like no it's all pretty made up everything but it's still like she's still writing sort of from her experience almost if that makes sense you know mm -hmm. like uh in the sense of like she is there are certain things she doesn't like and those are the things that she is internalizing uh but also that the movie is not spending a long time on those moments. It's just right. these little flashes. And later when you find out that those are made up, it's fine. You don't feel like you spent 45 minutes of the movie seeing stuff that wasn't real. You, you spend right. a total five minutes or something. And they always begin with showing her writing with the various yes, pens. Right. Yeah. You, you, the, the score is different for those sections. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this more like hazy Mm -hmm. Gauzy, yeah. Well, Trent Reznor and Atticus is Ross's score. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Yes. Yeah. Um, so and good. she does say in that montage, you know, the first parts are true. So right. it, it's she kind of an that. interesting take on that right. reliable note where it's like, it's kind of left to us to decide how much of what is true. When but you I, split. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like that also helped alleviate some of that. Okay. Well, it wasn't just lying. Like some of that was true. And we, we can use that to like help the, orient the ourselves. Setup, the setup of their relationship is an important part of their the story. And yeah. so to right. have that part be confirmed true is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we like kind some of, of have that. to have that. Yeah. Because I was thinking about this. It would just be when you're reading it in a book, you can sort of parse for yourself what is true or, or not true. And the book like sort of goes more in depth and then like offers you some more truth later on about like this, this was and wasn't. Um, but it's really tricky when you have to film it because your actors have to have something to play. Like right. the, the actor has to know the truth in that moment. And so I don't know I, if I would have made the same choice as David Fincher. I would like to think so. Cause I think it happens to be the right choice, but the choice of actually showing footage of things that are not true. Mm. So, mm -hmm. because they simply wouldn't make sense under those circumstances. So like the scene where she's in the bathtub and there's a shadow that goes by the door and she like mm -hmm. sinks so like she's all afraid of Nick, uh, you know, into the bathtub. You, you kind of do have to shoot that even though it's obviously not true and couldn't be because it just doesn't make any sense. The thing is we when we are by ourselves, we behave in our truest sense. And so when we, the audience, are watching a movie, when we see a character on screen by themselves, we assume that the way they're acting is not artifice, that it is who they actually are, because it's the sort of pact between us and a character who is alone. Mm. And that's where it really starts to get tricky. So like something like, so sorry guys, spoilers, a couple spoilers coming. <laughs> so something like The Usual Suspects, the twist works because Kaiser Soze, like Kevin Spacey's character, is talking to somebody else. So everything about that is performative. And so, but if he were by himself, right, and he were still acting like uh, verbal kids, right. we would be mad about that because right. he would not be acting that way alone, which right. is exactly the reason why the twist at the end of uh, Now You See Me, or what is it? What is that movie? Yeah. Yeah. Now You See Me. The ma the magician movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Because, sorry, everybody, Mark Ruffalo's character is the bad guy. and <laughs> But we see him by himself in that movie acting at, like the good guy alone in a room. 
Right. That and then later on sense. when you watch it, you're like, that makes no sense right. because that violates that pact. Right. And so it is it is a bold move on Fincher's part to shoot some of that stuff and put it in the movie. And it, it somehow works because of that, the carefulness it's of the diary framing. the diary yes. pieces. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, because, you know, even though we eventually learn that a lot of that is fake, it's still the diary that the police have. It's right. still the thing that everybody it's else is. Them. Yeah. It's a story that's being told to somebody in the movie, not just to the audience. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's cool that it yeah, functions on all those levels. Well, and it functions on a thematic level also, because you were touching on this earlier, Brian. Thematically, to me, the movie is about just sort of the performative nature of who we all are, right? Where Amy's not mad at Nick for being who he is necessarily, She's mad that that's not what she believed him to be or that he's not acting or performing in the way that she wants him to be. Right. Which is a major theme in the book. You know, they talk about like dancing monkey husbands and stuff like that. And <laughs> mm -hmm. sort of this whole comparison culture is really running through there as well, where she's like, we don't want to be that couple. Oh, are we going to be that couple now? Oh, we're having this fight. This idea like right. all of these all of our relationships are pre-scripted and they're performative is a major theme running through this. And then in fact, when they end up back together at the end, it's pretend, right? They are, they're just going to spend the rest of their lives pretending. Yeah. It's, it's something that actually where the ending really works for me mm -hmm. is as much as it's the kind of movie where you want the ending to be, you know, she gets caught or like some crazy stuff happens or who knows what it's also like, well, these terrible characters are terrible to each other and they cause each other pain. And then like, there's that line that's marriage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's, it's like, it's so dark. It's like this twisted lifetime movie where it's like, <laughs> right. instead of being, you take these little aggressions and emotional bruises that people get to each other in relationships, mm -hmm. but instead of being, you know, these tiny things, it's as big as it could possibly be. It's, mm -hmm. oh, he's having an affair, so then she fakes her own death and so that he will get, you know, mm -hmm. possibly, uh, you know, murdered yeah. or possibly uh, death uh, penalty. Put, to, put to death. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, But then it's sort of like them at the end having that conversation before they go for their interview sort of is what the movie is. It's right. like, here's here, here are these things that everyone does in a relationship just completely on you know yeah to turn to 11, 11 like yeah. crazy yeah. yeah well and i think i i find all that stuff really interesting and i think it also makes sense that amy i feel like we can safely say is a sociopath at the very least right. i yeah. mean the way yeah, yeah the the way she behaves and the way she flips on a dime, you yeah, know, right. it, it's not normal. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, I think it's an interesting, I like that her character is that. And, you know, after this movie came out, I spent a lot of time like researching sociopaths because mm -hmm. I find them very fascinating. Sure. Um, he just said, don't, don't at me. <laughs> sociopaths. Um, oh God. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the part of my understanding anyway of, of, kind of being a sociopath is not having the same kind of like identity um, solidity right. that like normal quote unquote people have. And that I think that that just works so well in this story. And I find really fascinating of like, because I think we all have that to a degree, like you were saying, Brian, like so much of our interactions are performative and like who I am with you guys isn't who I am with like other friends and like there are different mm -hmm. me's that I am at different times and it, I just found that really interesting to have her be such an extreme version of that of like oh I thought we were going to be these people and you're not holding up right you're part of the bargain like you were supposed to perform this person mm -hmm. right. I'm doing my job and just as a like delicious extreme thing I love that she's like and I'm going to kill myself that's part of her original plan. Yeah. Like, I I'm going to kill myself to really prove my point. <laughs> like, as well, a as a former person that was very dramatic when I was younger, I appreciate the <laughs> utmost drama. <laughs> like, so over-the-top dramatic. I just want to go on the record here, though, and say I disagree. She equates him not acting in the way that she wants him to, to murder like, she's like, that's murder. He took my expectations. That's the same as murder. It's not. I just want to be super clear I mean, about yeah, that. I would agree. Well, that's the sociopath part. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, right. of course. Well, and what and you were saying, part, Michael, yeah. too, about, like, sort of the self-identity, like, the way that we act around different people or groups of people or whatever, I think there that a lot of us or all of us that are quote unquote normal have a self identity as well. And again, that goes back to how we act when we are alone and the kind of person we perceive ourselves to be. And so like our ethical code is usually about like 
I can't act that way because that doesn't square with my version of myself. I don't want to be a bad, uh, like a a cruel person or Mm -hmm. a dishonest person or whatever. So like associating those kinds of adjectives with like who we are um, or whatever sort of nouns we end up calling ourselves, right? Like I'm a good person I because I do this and that and I'm generous and brave and whatever it is. So that idea of ourselves sort of governs what we're capable of. And I think if you didn't have that strong self-identity, like someone like Amy does not have that vision of herself that restricts and bounds what she is willing to do or not do. So Right. One thing that I got from this movie the first time I saw it that made me rather uncomfortable was that if you had no nuance in your brain and sure. watch this just straight up as just like a broad tale about a woman uh-huh uh it, it it struck me as like a men's rights activist wet yeah, dream it's troubling <laughs> and and so i was really curious because michael you're usually very sensitive to that kind of stuff and it seems like you didn't have that concern with this movie walking out of it and yeah i'm just curious to have a, yeah. a brief discussion about like it's it's very bold for a movie to you know there's not many like strong women characters in yeah. movies and so when it happens it's like a big deal and like this woman is basically like everything she does is a lie all the rape is fake all the yeah. like everything she says should not be trusted and she's destroying men with her like fake rape stories so and it's but it's written by a woman and it's got this an amazing monologue in the middle of it that's like a my favorite like feminist monologue ever maybe like i just i love the cool girl thing so i don't know it was a really confusing experience for me because I was like what is this movie trying to say to me about women and about yeah relationships and all that well I, th- I think one tricky thing and and I'm like I care very deeply about these issues but I also feel like not everything is these issues and I think right like when I watch a movie I'm not going oh this female character represents women and this sure. person of color represents people of color and that yeah, kind of that's thing. a privilege that you have Brian I understand yeah but uh but you know to me and I don't want to I'm not going to be like I don't see you know gender or whatever <laughs> as much as like I'm not watching this movie going oh the woman is doing this and the man I'm going no these are two brand new people I've never heard of before one of them is this character one of them is this character and here's what they are doing um now that's not to say movies don't do that you know they don't and obviously a movie like this it's hard not to look at it through this sort of scope of feminism, et cetera. Um, but I just, it's like, it's always tricky for me because I'm like, not every character of a certain race or gender is representing that well, race or gender. And it's almost like an ideal, like utopian yeah. world that will never exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then like any character can be anything and it shouldn't matter because people aren't going to take that to mean that X kind of person is like yeah. this. Well, and I think yeah. what's, what's, yeah, I, I agree that I that's the utopia that we should get there and that we're not. And especially four years ago, we weren't even more five no, years ago or whatever it was. We but I but so I think the, the part of the problem, which I think kind of both of you were just getting at is that it's when there's there aren't movies with a female protagonist, then when there is one, it's like, well now this sure. is women. It's this time. one character right. is like right like kind of necessarily has to represent that or the same thing with like a minority character or whatever it is. And I think for me, the reason Gone Girl didn't read that way is because there are other female characters in it that are very uh, featured and feel much more real. Like for to me anyway, Amy always felt like, well, this is not, this isn't a human. This is like a sociopath, like fictitious person. So like I, I, I almost didn't even read her as like a woman necessarily. And part of that is probably just, as I've said, like my interest in sociopaths. And so I feel like I was able to identify early on that this isn't like supposed to be a normal, you know, female human and that there are other, you know, Margot and Boney, I feel like are really are my two favorite characters Mm -hmm. in the movie. So I think that's for me anyway, what, kept me from reading it that way but i also completely understand that if you aren't picking up on those things uh that it is can be a very problematic film yeah well i really i'd like to say more before uh... (laughs) i was i was seriously like all three men got to get make sure their points got across first i seriously like when you guys were talking was gonna be like can i talk now (laughs) like (laughs) <laughs> oh lord okay well so the first time i saw this movie i 
bumped on all of that so hard, so much so that I could not appreciate anything else about it. Um, I think, and and it should be said, this movie was, this movie and this book were and are controversial. Um, there, you have Gillian Flynn, who self-identifies a, as a feminist, saying, which I think is a valid argument that, you know, we will truly have equality when we can allow women to be anything. Um, and that includes evil. Um, I do find this particular narrative to be more problematic than like, say, Sharp Objects, which I've also watched, um, because you have absolutely like evil women in Sharp Objects, not to spoil too much of it or anything, because it is more recent. You have women that are committing atrocities but not in the same politically charged way that Gone Girl is. Like, this specific narrative, I think, is really, really troubling. This idea that, like, this is a crazy woman, and if you scorn her, she will lie about you and legally accuse you of something you didn't do to destroy your life and reputation. That politically is in itself really upsetting. And so, like, in as much as I respect David Fincher and in as much as I do respect Gillian Flynn, and I, I think that this novel has so much worth, it is a feat of writing that I really respect. And obviously, its sales reflect that. Um, but But I do think that, for me, the problems of it are so palpable that it's hard to like get past them. And I thank you for bringing that up, Alex. I mean, uh, it was one of the main things yeah. that I walked out of the theater feeling Icky. very uncomfortable about. Yes. It was like, so this movie went there with this character and I'm not sure what it's saying about it. Right. So yeah. looking at it through, going back to the theme of like, performative actions and the media. I mean, keep in mind, so Gillian Flynn was writing for Entertainment Weekly. She was laid off just like Nick's character was in 2008 at the when the recession hit, experienced a loss of identity surrounding that, which Nick's character also reflects. The, the, all those themes are definitely embedded in here. And also this is like social media heyday. Right. Um, and we are crafting lives. Like Instagram just said it sort of happened and all this stuff as she starts writing this book. And so we are crafting lives that look a certain way or we're trying to like portray ourselves in a certain way. So when you read this movie through that lens, I think it's absolutely a useful conversation about that thematically. I just find the specifics of the way that the deception and the way that this sociopathy manifests itself in Amy to be very um her tactics are very specific you yeah, know sociopaths can do a lot of different things mm -hmm. yeah. but the thing that she does is the thing that and look yeah. Desi's not a good person but he doesn't deserve to have his throat <laughs> sure. cut in that way like it's it's bad do but, but I feel like her cutting his throat isn't isn't the problem. I mean, it's cold blooded murder, problem. but it's, but you're, I mean, in as much as I there's love that political, scene that we were talking about, there's less political charge around women killing people than women right. lying and about rape. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, I love that scene where he goes and talks to Tommy O'Hara because it does, like, in terms of plot, it does mm -hmm. expand our minds about what this could be or what's going on. And Scoot McNary, who I love so <sighs> much, I love his performance in that scene. But that scene is really like that's clearly a pre Me Too era scene that I feel like you just would want to shy away from now. Mm -hmm. um, so I I don't I don't think that Gillian Flynn is like a bad person or not a feminist or anything like that. And I like I said I fundamentally agree with her argument. I just can't deal with this in that sense. It's something that I think about a lot, and it's like part of me. The last thing I ever want to do is like jump on the bandwagon of like. The best way to, to you know, fight uh, sexism and racism is just to be angry about everything, you know, and I think that, like, mm -hmm. that's why a lot of times I challenge things. Part of it's because I want to learn, but it's also because I want to be like, let's make sure we're not going too far in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's nothing less feminist you can do than put, make a movie with just all great female characters who have no flaws, you right. know, right. which well, is not course. which is yeah. not what we're talking about with right. Gone Girl, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Right. Um, but one thing, uh, having had Wonder Woman come out a couple years ago and then now Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel. There's oh. there's this scene in Wonder Woman 
where it's just like the big moment where she says to Chris Pine, you know, they're on the battlefield and they're and they're gonna. She wants to charge out into battle, and he's mm-hmm. like, "Hold on, like we have to talk about some things. There's a plan. There's a way you, you do things. These things." And she's like, "You don't get to tell me what to do." And she runs out in the battlefield, and I'm like, "What a bad like, yeah. <laughs> like emotionally, it's very powerful." The woman is telling the man, "Like, no, I get to make the rules around here." But mm-hmm. I'm like, logically, I'm like, forget gender. There's a guy who knows he's done this before <laughs> you've never yeah. even been on this planet before and you're like let's go <laughs> whereas captain marvel it's it's less that it's more just she keeps getting knocked down by people who happen to be men but that's even like that's even less relevant it's just that it's a female character who keeps getting knocked down and keeps getting up again and like that's kind of where that central thing is you know i think that's to me was more nuanced i think than wonder woman no i absolutely agree i think captain marvel is simply a better movie i really appreciated that they didn't try to shoehorn in a romantic plot line into Mm, it which i think is really like to me that's like one of the most feminist things about that movie is that she is not in any way like i want to say sexualized but which is true but i'm just saying that like her gender isn't quite as becoming a plot point in the Mm. way that it does sort of in Wonder Woman. But yeah, I think, you know, when we talked about Silence of the Lambs, first of all, that movie, I think can probably pass a Bechdel test. But like (laughs) what we have is somebody who's simply like good at her job, doing her job. um, And I is a full, well-realized, well-rounded and flawed character. And again, I agree. We should have women that do everything. They should do everything and they can be evil. I agree. I just, this is like, whew, Yeah, it's, it's of course, this it's, is extreme. It's, it's the very specific way in which she is evil yeah. that just at this exact, exact. moment right. is like, it's just like it's sensitive. Right, right, yeah. right. And do you, so do you think that there is a, a version of this story mm. then that could work? Like, do you think it's a problem within the actual text of the film and how it's handled within the walls of itself as a movie? Or is it just the concepts the choices that were made about how the character behaves just fundamentally don't are are problematic at this point i think they're fundamentally problematic at this point Mm -hmm. um who could have predicted like the era that we are in now i mean well women um (laughs) half the population population. but just like the actual takedown of monsters like harvey weinstein and stuff like that it to me like and a lot of the women that i talk to it's it's just amazing that anything is happening like that anything is actually changing that we are able to like say these things out loud and people are like even somewhat listening but at the same time there's so much we have so far to go so and i I agree with you fundamentally michael that it is unfair and i agree with you too brian it is unfair to place all of our like hopes for this utopian future where we do have true equality on any one movie that is absolutely unrealistic and it is also not the job of the movie truthfully like it's not captain marvel's job it's not wonder woman's job to give us this magical future on that's not the role that it is taking on. It's not a burden that it can even shoulder or ne- and never would be able to. But until we have a profusion of movies, female-led movies, where we have this amazing diversity and range and it doesn't become about financing one of these movies just because it's politically convenient to do so, until we have that, then we can't have Gone Girl, I don't think. And that makes me sad because there is so much to praise about this movie. But when I think that's just what makes it so interesting to navigate or, or just why it's all so complex and hard, I feel yeah. like for, you know, for everyone at different levels of hardness, obviously. Uh, but I remember like after Blade Runner 2049 came out that there was kind of a backlash against that also. And I, I think it's the, that thing kind of that you were just saying is that I think a lot of people have trouble when an individual film that they love and mm-hmm. that in isolation uh, spoke to them and is great. Like it's hard for them to then see that kind of judged in right. the landscape of everything else. And that, that can feel very unfair. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's also just the reality of the situation. Yeah. And so I, I think that's worth like talking about and like acknowledging because I think, you know, it helps people like to be heard and acknowledged mm-hmm. but like yeah this it's not necessarily his job this movie's job to 
change the world or represent the ideal of everything. Right. So like maybe in and of itself, it could be a good movie, but it's coming out now and this is where we are and there's a greater responsibility to be had. Right. Yeah. And it, it's it's that weird thing where I, I, I also see all, all sides of this. And, you know, I even I went and saw it. Ghost in the Shell, with Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> I saw that too. And like, I was really happy to see like interesting sci-fi stuff, like mm-hmm. anything that wasn't just you know, I don't know, just the usual Hollywood sci-fi fare, but like more interesting design. And I'm just a big sci-fi nerd, so I was just happy to see that realized with a big budget. And so I was like, oh, I'm so sad this movie's so controversial because I want more movies like this, you know, in this genre, mm-hmm. in this kind of imagination and. Um, and definitely not a perfect movie by any means, but there were a lot, a lot of things I liked about it. But I also understand the idea of like, if you're not going to cast you know, an Asian lead yeah. in a, a movie that's literally taking place in, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I get all, it. All so the I, things I get it. Yeah. So it's 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 a really hard thing. I think it was just at the moment this movie came out. I think it was it was the fact that I I genuinely on the first viewing at least wasn't sure what the movie was saying about all this right mm-hmm. that was what was made me uncomfortable i like I, I think you could even have like almost a and i think by the end it, it felt almost satirical with the you know that's marriage baby mm-hmm. so that kind of was helping me but yeah i when a movie does make clear story choices and it's like the way the villain does the thing is this way and this villain is a married woman who's scoring like yeah like the movie does make a lot of choices of how she chooses to get her revenge how she chooses to manipulate men mm-hmm. and maybe those are just yeah just these are the the tools a housewife has whatever anyway it just made enough choices and it didn't tell me enough about how it felt about it for me to be like okay this movie is aware of the context it's in it's aware of how this could right. seem to a dumb dumb who went and watched it. it was like oh yeah women are like this and it didn't wrap it up in a way that made me feel like it knew all that and was like making a statement about it right it just seemed like it did it and that was it and that was my problem with it yeah if i could pivot a little sure. into sure. uh because yeah. i want i want to talk about the cast before we yes, before we yes, wrap yes. up yes. and uh, one one thing about this movie that was where amy the character was a positive force for me not that her character is positive but was rosamund pike's performance because i feel like it's the kind of performance I had been wanting for a while, just like like a female character who was just more like unhinged and like not just sort of like I'm playing this one role. Like I might be an important character, and my character might be a strong character, but like doesn't have a chance to do a lot of acting kind of thing. Um, and I remember when uh, Dark Knight Rises was announced and it was all the rumors and everything. I was like, I just want to see a female give. Heath Ledger's performance not the same performance obviously mm-hmm. but like something that like just out there and like kind of like not technically anything just sort of like uh, unbridled but still controlled and then it, it, the weird thing is there ended up being two female villains in that movie but one like ends up not really being a villain and one's not a villain for the whole time until the last five minutes and you're like well oh, not that rises yeah, yeah, yeah. that rises yeah so uh so it's like you never really get that kind of what I was talking about, you know, and then it's like, yeah, now you have Harley Quinn and Suicide Squad, but it's like, that doesn't really count. You know? <laughs> um, so I think it's something that like, it's like if there were 10 movies like this, I don't know how I'd feel about like Gone Girl or like her performance specifically, but it's like, it's something that at the time I was like, I like that. I like that I'm seeing someone give this like totally kind of unhinged performance where it's like, she just, she can change. She plays four different characters in the movie basically. Right. And then she changes from one to the other. And like, you can see her physically change and she's like, it's just like, like I find it captivating uh, for that reason. Um and I like the rest of the cast too. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah. No, I I think this movie is really well cast across the board. Like yeah. everybody's great in it. Ben Affleck is great in it, although weirdly ripped the whole time because <laughs> um, he was making. Yeah, we talked about this earlier, but he's making Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice, everyone's favorite film, mm-hmm. uh, and he is just like distractingly muscular in this movie. We're, makes no sense for Nick to be that ripped um, from a character perspective. I'm just saying he owns a bar and he used to be a journalist. So it's not anyway. He's got to look good for his students. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really, really like his performance here. You do get the sense that he's just 
absolutely caught in a riptide mm-hmm, and right. can't not can't get his way out of it at not all in any for way what equipped. he's in no and of course yeah and then we talked about kim dickens and patrick fugit every neil patrick harris yeah. is right fun yeah creepy as it's hell. the funniest it's neil great. patrick harris tyler perry movie i think i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny i really yeah like and tyler, tyler perry, perry too yeah. Yeah. which especially at the time he had barely done anything yeah. like right. this he's great but it's something fincher has done um in a few of his movies because you have Justin Timberlake in Social Network, mm-hmm. uh, Dwight Yoakam in Panic Room, who was originally supposed to be played by Maynard James Keenan uh, of Tool and uh, Perfect mm-hmm. Circle. Uh, he So it's just like he likes, all happen to be musicians, but like he likes uh, putting, I think, those, those characters here like not quite sure of you know and then they like give a performance where you're like oh <laughs> like yeah. yeah good job yeah. Like, yeah. that's cool and i feel like carrie coon as the sister is also just like i i think i would not enjoy the movie were it not for her mm-hmm. like i think mm-hmm. having her as someone that cares about nick yeah yeah is really important and i buy their relationship and she just like balances that like you're my brother so i like i want to I want to care about you. I want to be helping you, but you're also doing all these stupid things. And I just like, I feel her struggle and back and forth just so well. I feel like she's my favorite. The character really grounds the book also. I Mm -hmm. feel like you would have basically nobody to like if you didn't have her. Right. I also think it's weird they cast a Sella Ward as the, um, the second interviewer, the one that interviews Mm -hmm. him because she's, uh, the the wife and the fugitive yeah. so it's like another movie about a guy wrongly accused of yeah. killing his wife <laughs> with the same line i did not kill my wife yeah exactly <laughs> All right, cool. Well, do we want to go around and uh, talk about what are the lessons that we uh, will take away from Gone Girl? Trisha? Uh yeah, so i guess one of the biggest lessons that i have here is just about structure. Um the midpoint reveal is really well timed and or maybe my maybe my lesson is more about pacing because there's a ton of exposition here and y- you have to have all of it in order to get to that midpoint place. You can't get rid of any of it, unfortunately. Um, but the way that it is like spaced all the way out, and we talked about that montage. Again, pacing is really, really key there. Um, and like people have talked about this too, you know, how even in the opening credits, the names are only on screen for two seconds rather than four. So it really sort of... It's really fast. It's really yeah. quick. And I feel the like way Fincher always does that. Yeah. Because I, I feel like I even remember in like Fight Club, he wanted it just to be like a single frame. Yeah. And then, yeah. I guess just, just in writing a script to be conscious of time. And I think that that, because time is so sen- like central to the plot also, where it's like it's always framing two days gone, three days gone being conscious of time and the way that you dole out information in order to be able to achieve those reveals, I think is really useful here to study. For sure. Yeah. Brian? Um, I'm going to cheat a little and steal your lesson from your video, uh, but only because it's, it ties into other scripts that I've been reading uh, the efficient action lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's less efficient, efficient actually, as much as what you were saying in the video about setting the mood so that even if the actual dialogue gets changed, you know what the mood is here. Um, and I've been reading a couple scripts, which I will not name because, you know, I've been reading them for certain reasons. Spoilers. Um, (laughs) but, uh, and one especially that I was reading was written by a guy who's more of a novelist than a screenwriter. Um, and some of these scripts have these little things of just, you know, there's a building and the building's been here longer than time or something like that. These little kind of poetic things that when you read the script, you're like, well, that what does that do? Like how, how does a filmmaker read that and go like, let's show the building, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but then when you, when it's done efficiently, I think it really just like, it can actually kind of tug at your heartstrings a little bit when you're reading it. Cause you're like, ah, there's this little like bit of poetry here before the dialogue kicks in. But then if you do it too much, if you then suddenly it's like you have like two or three lines to kind of set that mood before you have to be like, let's get back into the actual movie itself. Um, because if you do it too much, then people are like, why are you describing, you know, like a building for for half a page or something? Um, but I just thought it was, it was cool to see in, in the um, in the Gone Girl video, but because I had just been reading scripts that were doing that and how effective they were in the script, even if it's something that you can't. It's like even if it's absolutely impossible to capture that in uh, in a movie. It, it gives the reader, anybody who's reading the script or making the movie, it gives them that that mood of what this moment is. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's also a thing that I've wanted to like qualify since the first video because I, I feel like the example that I give is it's like writing what's inside the character's heads. 
and that in and of itself i don't think is good like that's not what you're supposed to do right right like don't write things that you can't show on screen but i think what i like about it and gone girl is that it's it accompanies the physical action that you can see so like even if you took out the line of what they're thinking and how they're approaching it you still via their actions understand what's mm-hmm. happening mm-hmm. and then the way she writes that extra line kind of gives it that nice little spin that right. can make it that adds to that tone and emotion mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh cool alex so i mentioned this earlier but the part of the movie that really where i sort I of lean forward and get into it both times i watched it is when detective boney shows up at the house and they kind of do that initial tour of the house mm-hmm. And it was just another lesson, which I already know, but I also always need to be reminded of it, is that it's so much fun to watch somebody interesting be good at their job. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you know, it's just so much fun to watch her walk through that house, notice all the details, take note of her mm-hmm. degrees in the wall, take note of, you know, oh, the iron's still on. And it just, I, it's so much fun to watch that. And I don't, I don't even know why, but it's like, that was the first point in the movie where I'm like riveted moment to moment just watching her do her basic mm-hmm. job mm-hmm. so it's the it's entire her... basis of the movie spotlight just watching, <laughs> right, people, right. watching people right. be good at their jobs <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's what it could have been called basically <laughs> <laughs> it's it's her it's both of their performances too it's his yeah. house but like it's her house now <laughs> you know she's right. like walking the, around the way she totally. occupies the space yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's so many choices being made by her as an actress too that make it captivating yeah but yeah just watching somebody who who also like the way they approach their job is not kind of in a uh, just getting the job done just going to go mm-hmm. through the motions but she's genuinely seems like turned on by it like yeah. like her intellect is enjoying this job and it's just very fun to watch mm. and i feel like there's even little details planted about her where like like i feel like i know a lot about her even yeah. though mm, we don't right. know that much about her but sort of how the brief lines she does talk about with like her personal life or like mm-hmm. you know my old ex and i used to do this like you do get the sense that like this job is like her life in a way yeah. that i think is really compelling i'm gonna steal from myself also <laughs> and, <laughs> it's a good uh, source <laughs> re- re-watching that that first video um the lesson from Truby's book about the last line is the point of the scene. That was actually a big moment for me where I got excited about the channel was like arriving at that lesson. And I think that his book, The Anatomy of Story, had a lot of uh, lessons in it that worked for me in ways that other screenwriting books hadn't. And so it kind of sparked mm-hmm. this like, oh, wait, I, I understand this and I see how it's actionable versus, you know, some screenwriting books use words that are lofty and from the hero's journey and Campbell and mm-hmm. stuff that's that's hard to um, act upon. But yeah, the idea of just there's an upside down triangle. The last line is the point of the scene. And even if it isn't exactly that every time, I think it helps focus you as like a scene is about a thing. Like this scene is about this thing. And by the end of the scene, it needs to have changed and it needs to send things on, you know, in a new direction. And so I watching the video again that I had kind of nostalgia memories for for the last line is the point of the scene. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Cool. Uh, what's everyone watching this week? Brian. So I've mentioned the uh, the Vista Theater in LA before. Uh, I went there to, they're doing a series right now called The Inspiration and the Inspired. So they're doing mm-hmm. like a matinee of Sunset Boulevard and then a midnight screening of Mulholland Drive, nice. for instance. Nice. Um, and uh, they recently did a matinee of Buster Keaton's The General. I love that movie so <laughs> it's much. It's so joyful. And then <laughs> a midnight screening of Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Perfect. Which George That's... Miller did say. He's like, that. Mm-hmm. This because the general is the same yep. thing. It's half it the movie's going one direction and half the movie's coming the other way. It's the train? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. And uh, so I, we did not go to the midnight screening, but my girlfriend hadn't seen Fury Road. So I, we did go home and then watch it that night, you nice. know, which, you know, was fun because halfway through, or no, 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, yeah, by the way, this movie is freaking ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I was not expecting this. Yeah. Um, but uh, but no, the general was just like it was especially the first like half of the movie. It's such a joy to watch. It's just like I was like just smiling and like <laughs> laughing out loud at so many moments. There's a moment where uh, there's a cannon that he's trying to fire over his train to shoot the other train and the cannon like falters. So it's actually pointing right at him and he doesn't know what to do. So he picks up a piece of wood and just throws it at the cannon. <laughs> And I did like I'm not a big like laugh out loud person, but I kind of lunge forward when something, and I like completely lunged. Um, but uh, yeah, and just his physical comedy. It's amazing how a movie like that holds up. Yes, because everything he did was practical. It like you know Fury Road. Well, not everything Fury Road, yeah. obviously, but like. Um, 
and everything he did was practical. So he was like uh, taking tweezers to like get just the right amount of gunpowder so that the cannon would shoot exactly where he wanted it to shoot and mm-hmm. stuff and mm-hmm. all these like little stunts. And, and he's just he's just so fun to watch yes. comedically too. There's a part he's trying to get from one side of the room to the other and he walks over the desks instead of walking mm-hmm. around them. And it's just like, it makes you giggle, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, highly recommend it, especially if you can go, you know, most people don't have this ability, but seeing it in 35 millimeter in, yeah. a, in like a nice theater is uh, was really cool. That's awesome. awesome. Cool. Trisha? Uh, I recently, for the first time, watched the 1988 version of Dangerous Liaisons, starring John Malkovich, Glenn Close, Uma Thurman, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Keanu Reeves. What? What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is so good. Uh, directed by Stephen Frears, wonderful British director, based on the French novel from... 1782 wow. and it's like a full period costume drama um if you're familiar with cruel intentions yeah. that's an adaptation of the same novel so the 90s sort of like we're gonna update all the classical stuff into modern day high schools 10 things i hate about exactly. you. Yeah. oh yeah yeah um so it but this is like the full period drama version of it and uh it's sort of is like if you want to see a a sort of strong diabolical woman at the center of a plot glenn close's character in dangerous liaisons is amazing she's doing nothing but playing manipulation and sex games and they're very dastardly and quite de- just delicious to like <laughs> Sounds great, watch yeah. her yeah. be evil yeah so, awesome. and john malkovich's performance is amazing they're all great they don't like keanu reeves say anything it's perfect great <laughs> Perfect. He's well used. <laughs> yeah. But fun fact: uh, Rachel on Friends says her favorite movie is Dangerous Liaisons, but it's actually Weekend at Bernie's. That's true. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Trivia. These are things I know. Yeah. Uh, Alex. Uh, so the uh, you guys may have heard before. I think I've I've gushed about Blue Planet Two on a mm-hmm. previous oh, yeah. podcast. Yes. I'm a big BBC nature documentary aficionado. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Netflix just released their own kind of competitor, big epic nature doc series called Our Planet. And there's some controversy because they poached David Attenborough. Oh, and they, they got some people who made the original Planet Earth and they just got the Blue Planet 2 guy to come over. So they're like wow. stealing, they're holding me in a cage. They're, they're like stealing BBC's <laughs> thunder. But the argument they're making is that like we release everything worldwide immediately. Mm, BBC, right. it's like you have to wait a year for it to go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Our planet. I watched the first couple episodes. Really well done. I I feel like it's covering a lot of the same territory as if you've. Most people haven't watched them multiple times like me. <laughs> but there's like, oh, they've already covered this animal or this situation. But the difference with our planet is that it has a more dire kind of environmental message mm-hmm. running throughout. It's not just saved for like the end of an episode or like the last episode. And it and it's really powerful because they're actually showing it. They're not just saying like, here's a really beautiful pristine nature scene. But then also beware, it might go away someday. They're showing things like uh, walruses in the Arctic, like literally don't have any ice anymore to like be on. And so they're like climbing onto like rocky cliffs and like falling off of them and dying. There's not room for all of them. Like, so it's like not always happy, this show. It's like, but it's really interesting to see a nature show actually show those things and not just here's the pretty perfectness of nature, but Mm -hmm. but it's going to go away. Trust us. And one of the most amazing sequences is at the end of the first episode, they show a kilometer long stretch of a glacier break off from Greenland. Whoa. And it literally is like, a, it's a shot I've never seen before of basically a skyscraper sized piece of ice, like go into the water and lift up the water right. into a massive tidal wave. And it's like, you've never seen anything like it. It looks Yikes. like the Titanic sinking. And it's Amazing. it's really it's worth watching just for that scene. It's insane. Yeah, I've been recently revisiting uh, <laughs> pretty randomly, but I ended up revisiting some cutscenes from a video game called The Witcher Three, yeah. which <laughs> is one of my favorite video games of all time. Uh, and re rewatching some of these cutscenes and remembering the story, uh, it just reminded me how like that video game if you haven't played it's like an rpg game um and it's it's based on these series of books that were written uh and so it's i think it's the best mashup of writing and character and video game that i've ever seen before where like you end up being really invested in all these characters uh but it also works super well as a video game and they're kind they're the kind of characters that you don't see in video games like 
the protagonist isn't, you know, a hyper masculine, like, I'm just here to shoot stuff. And this mm-hmm. is Call of Duty. Like he, he is that because he's uh, got a very know, growly, deep masculine voice. Right. And he's like a monster slayer and all these things. <laughs> but but that, what makes it interesting is that like he has this kind of like heart of gold and is actually very soft and is sort of surrounded by a lot of like feminine energy and all the other like main characters are all women that are all really cool and they're different ways so topless half the time but still well it's <laughs> it is definitely problematic and that is very much aimed toward young straight men yeah, yeah. uh but the writing shines through nonetheless <laughs> uh, well and saved he, and i appreciate and he gets, that part he gets naked too right yeah they definitely i mean they gets, objectify him see, a fair yeah. amount yeah great not everything equal but, opportunity yeah, <laughs> kind of objectify, yeah. <laughs> objectify equally oh boy <laughs> Uh, awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation about Gone Girl. Uh, be sure to subscribe to Beyond the Screenplay wherever you listen to your podcasts and leave us a review on iTunes because it really, really helps us grow the channel. And finally, thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. Adios. Bye.